Would the young people come forward, please? morning how are you how are you guys today that's good all right so I was sitting in coffee husks this morning and uh, just talking to a few folks and I said you know I, I can't come up with anything for a children's moment today I'm just completely devoid of ideas for a children's moment and Russ Osted said well you know if you talk to Rusty about snowmobiling you could probably fill up a good 15 minutes. <laughs> Rusty, did you get a new snowmobile? Yes. You did? Have you, have you been out on a ride? Yes. You have? Where'd you go? 40. 40. I don't know what that means. Not being a snowmobiler, I'm not sure what that means. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, so... What's the big problem of getting a snowmobile right now? The snow's melting, right? Yeah, we're just about done with snowmobiling, aren't we? There were some spots last week where the snow was melted? Yeah, well, by next week, buddy, it's going to be all gone. <laughs> and then we won't have any more snowmobiling. So I was trying to think how I was going to have that have anything to do with our message today. And I got thinking about it. You know, if you own a snowmobile, the one thing you got to be sure to do is when it snows, you got to go out snowmobiling, right, Rusty? Yeah. So our, our message today is called urgency, and where Jesus talks about when you have a chance to do something good, you better go out and do it. So just like when there's snow on the ground, you ought to be out snowmobiling. If you have a chance to do something nice for somebody, you know, to help out your mom or to do something good for a friend or whatever, you ought to take advantage of it before it's too late and that chance is gone, right? All right. I thought we did pretty good with that, Rusty. <laughs> right, let's have a prayer for you. Gracious Lord, we, uh, we thank you for snowmobiles and snow. Those are certainly blessings in our lives. And we thank you for those opportunities that come by our way, that you give to us to use the gifts that you have given us to help others. And we ask that you encourage each and every one of these children to, to live lives of helping, loving, being kind to others. And we ask that you bless them and their families. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me this morning. Today's first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on his name while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, 
Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and when he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. The word of the Lord. Keep having random thoughts as I'm sitting there, which is probably not a good sign for the sermon this today, but... Um, the reason it's so cold in here is because the furnace shut off last night, and when I got in here this morning, I had to reset it, and it's trying to catch up, but uh, sorry that you all have to wear your jackets today. So did you ever, on a beautiful sunny morning, maybe in springtime when the flowers are blooming, just lift your hands up in celebration and thank the Lord for the blessing of a wonderful day? I have, and I'm sure many of you have as well. So do you ever thank the Lord for an ugly day? A gray, rainy, windy, cold, ugly day? Probably not. So ask yourself, does God not create all days, both the fair and the cloudy? Are not all days blessings? Or does God just bless us on some days, the good days, and not so much on the other days? There are days in all our lives when things go wrong, sometimes seriously wrong. And then, of course, there are also days which are glorious. So what, if anything, does God have to do with that fact? The comments of the prophet Isaiah and of Jesus that we shared in our scripture reading today deal at least in part with those very questions. In Jesus' time, just like in Isaiah's time, people believe that great calamity was caused by great sin. And likewise, they believe that great righteousness would bring good fortune. So Jesus tried to correct that impression. And he pointed to two great calamities of the time. Pilate had evidently executed some Galileans as they were worshiping, and, and the blood of the executed people mixed with the blood of the sacrifices that they had been making to the Lord. And then also a tower in Jerusalem called the Tower of Siloam had fallen, crushing many people who were passing by. So Jesus asked his audience, were these people guilty of anything more than the rest of the Galileans or the rest of us in Jerusalem? And then he answered the question. He said, no, very emphatically. It was just bad luck. They were at the wrong place at the wrong time. But do not be deceived, Jesus said. We are all in the same boat and we will all die. When and where is pretty much a random issue. Therefore, we should repent and make our peace with this world and with our God before it is too late. Well, we know better, really, than those ancient people that Jesus spoke to, right? We understand that God created the universe and the humans within it to be free. And we understand that bad things happen to good people, and bad people quite often enjoy worldly success. We may not understand why that is, but we realize that it's a fact. Roy Ferraro, who was the bully in our school when I was growing up and should have, have been punished, always seemed to thrive. He was successful in sports. He was successful socially, at least on the level we were living at. And he was even successful in academics because most kids allowed him to cheat never seemed fair to me. But nevertheless, it taught me a very valuable lesson about life. Good deeds are not always rewarded, and bad deeds 
are not always punished, at least not in this world. So are we really smarter than those ancient folks? If we are, then do we call those bad days when the weather is ugly or we are sick or someone we love is sick or someone we care for has passed away, do we call those days blessings? Or do we just reserve that for the sunny days? And beyond all that, why does our moralizing seek to condemn a certain evil scapegoat or a designated sinner or sin or group of sinners as being worse than all the rest of us, rather than concentrate on just doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Jesus was a great healer and teacher, yet he chose to follow his calling to death on the cross, which cut short his ministry on earth and left many in need of his healing. And he did so because it was a way that he could do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. In his case, to provide a way to God and to eternal life for all people for all time. In the parable of the fig tree, Jesus reminds his followers and us that life, despite the randomness, is not meaningless. It's not about eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. No, rather, we are called by God to bear fruit. As the fig tree's purpose is to grow figs, so it is our purpose to do good things. And there's a definite sense of urgency in his message. So what if, like the fig tree, you were told that you had a year to live? What would you do? Many people have today what they call a bucket list of things that they want to do before they die. And often these lists include fun places to visit or adventures to be accomplished like skydiving or bungee jumping, both of which are insane as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) But what would be on your list if you knew you had a year to go? What would be the urgency to get certain things done? What order would you do them in, knowing that you might not make it all the way through to the end of the list? Would doing good deeds or being righteous be at the top of your list or even on it? How about repentance? I mean, really, you know, I have a year to go. I'm going to put a fun thing like repentance on my list. Well, what does true repentance look like? You know, I'm lucky. I can remember my great-grandmother who lived from 1857 to 1958. And in 1958, I was 12, so I remember her quite well. In her later years, she lived with her children, spending you know, some months with one and then some months with another and so on. And I noticed one time that she had been at my grandparents' house for longer than usual. And I asked her why she hadn't gone to Uncle Henry's yet. And she said that they had a falling out and that they were not speaking to each other. I don't remember the cause, but I remember my mother, upon hearing this, sitting down next to my great-grandma and saying, Grandma, it doesn't really matter which of you is right or wrong. You're an old woman. Who knows how many days that you have left? Do you really want to leave this earth without making peace with one whom you love? At the time, I was somewhat taken aback that my mother would speak to her grandmother that way. But I came to understand that that is good advice for all of us. We need to live our lives with a sense of urgency. We need to be at peace with each other and also with our God. Repent and turn back to God. Follow Jesus. Shoulder your cross. How high would those things be on your list? Isaiah captures this same sense of urgency in his usual elegant language. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. It's never too late to turn to God. God is amazingly flexible with his creation. God hates evil and he desires love. And yet he is merciful toward us sinners. 
who do or allow evil to happen and sometimes fail to love. Isaiah says that we will never fully understand God, but surely we can see the facts as they are laid before us. We all sin. If we repent, God promises a pardon. God always keeps his promises. This process of confession, repentance, and mercy is a continuous, lifelong process which requires discipline and faith. Now, it is true that we are all saved purely through the grace of God. We are saved, as the Apostle Paul says, through faith alone. But there is more to faith than we sometimes acknowledge. Faith is an action word. We are called to follow Jesus. That's the path to God. Jesus healed the sick, fed the poor, invited in the outcast, was a peacemaker, and loved all people. He was not afraid of death. He gained eternal life. These are the very same actions that our faith should lead us to. The message of the parable of the fig tree is do not put these things aside for another day. It is a matter of great urgency. Let us pray. Gracious and forgiving God, we confess to you that sometimes we take the gift of faith for granted and we fail to produce fruit. We do not do the good work of the gospel. We do not live as though we actually believe your word. In your mercy, accept our repentance and direct us in the way of salvation. Forgive our trespasses and help us to forgive others. Above all, help us to put love of our fellow humans above the love for earthly accomplishments. We come to you in humble faith this morning, faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand for him.